You're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast in English and Persian via New Channel TV. Hello everyone, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Borspuya. In this week's programme, we interview Theresa Barbat, Member of the European Parliament on Secularism and the EU. We'll also be talking about the tragic terrorist attack against the people of Brussels, Saudi Arabia uncovered, a fatwa against women's voices and skateboarding girls in Afghanistan. Stay with us. In the week that passed, we have the tragic attack on the people of Brussels by the Islamic State. And, you know, the first thing one feels is just utter outrage at the fact that there are people going about their daily lives. They're at the airport. It's before the Easter holidays. People want to go on, you know, away uh, for a long break. Or they're on the, uh, on the train, getting, going to work and what have you. And they're, they're met with death and destruction. There are no words to explain how people must feel in a situation like that. And, and uh, when you actually hear the voice of a child screaming and you see the, the nature of the barbarity of the Islamic State and uh, Al-Qaeda and the Islamists, that nothing stops them to achieve what they want, which is basically destruction and dark scenario for everybody. Um, so really, I think the first thing we've got to do, we've got to um, send our sympathy to people of Brussels and stand in solidarity with them, and that's, that's important. The second issue is um, everybody starts sort of uh, interpreting the situation and try to bring their own policy. You have immediately um, people on a, you know, the right being tried to sort of think, okay, here we go, start pointing to the immigrants and sort of... Um, and Muslims. And, uh, and Muslims and, you know, and just blaming people rather than um, actually pointing uh, the finger to the... Um, to the people who are actually responsible for this. Yeah. And I think that is key because the fact of the matter is that if you want to solve the problem of terrorism, you have to look at the movements that are using terrorism in order to promote their, their rule, their gain, their influence. And it's the Islamists that do yeah. that. So it's targeting that movement rather than people who might have similar beliefs or come from similar backgrounds. Sure. And also, on the other hand, you have people who try to justify uh, this atrocity and Islamic regime um, and Islamic State and Islamist movement. Uh, they try to always blame and excuse this for, by different ways. You had George Galloway saying, you know, this is like the, uh, um, this is the result of the, uh, what, you know, Europeans and imperialism have, has done. Nothing justifies this. Mm. But also, I mean, the fact of the matter is that even if someone is outraged at imperialism, is outraged at Western government intervention, how does killing innocent people have anything to do with this? They're not even targeting the states mm. that have, for example, perpetrated what they think is, is a criminal act. Mm. Uh, you know, they're targeting innocent civilians and it just shows the bankruptcy of those that defend the Islamists and their murder of innocent people. On the other hand, it also shows the bankruptcy of these far-right and right-wing groups that want to immediately blame the most vulnerable in society, sure. migrants who are fleeing the same Islamic terrorists that we watched in Brussels, yeah. uh, and also Muslims who are often targeted by the Islamists as well. And immediately you, you could see, for example, the uh, right-wing Republican uh, um, uh, candidates for the um, um, presidential election in America um, to start talking about rounding on people and sort of um, uh, patrolling the Muslim areas. I don't know how they can identify Muslim areas yeah. in, in America. And some people actually cheering for this, you know, mm -hmm. and ignoring the solidarity that exists before. And immediately after these atrocities, and people come out in solidarity with uh, people who are victim of this, and uh, there are the right big groups who ridicule this. They say, this is not the, what they want, you know. Uh, uh, look, they, oh yes, we expect people come in solidarity, they bring the piano out, you know, right? So, you know, they're just ridiculing this. Is this is the sort of thing that someone like Douglas Morris has said, making fun of acts of solidarity by refugees with the people of Brussels. And again, uh, you know, what I think is, the reality of it is you do see people using um, these instances of mass human tragedy uh, and um, 
you know, this, this hu human rage that takes place after such a hor horrible incident, using it to promote politics that are inhuman. Yes. You know, if one is really concerned about terrorism in Europe and across the world, because don't forget what happens in Brussels happens every day in the Middle East and North Africa, then we need to figure out how we're going to solve this issue. And one of the ways is to target the Islamists, not Muslims and migrants. And I think that there is a very clear sort of, you know, everybody talks about these 5,000 Islamists and the jihadists. Well, target is a very clear. 5,000. Yeah, they, they're saying that the 5,000 jihadists lose in Europe. Exactly. And that they've come back. Yeah. Exactly. So, target these uh, groups. The, most of these, are, I would say 95% of these, are known to the security forces but and the even states. after every sort of attack, we hear that they were being followed, that they were known. Well, why don't you bloody arrest them? Yeah. Arrest them, target them, prosecute them, uh, you know, focus on them. And I think one of the, the things is that in situations like this, people want an easy target. And I think it's easy to target Muslims and migrants rather than you know, targeting the jihadis who need to be targeted and also targeting states like the Saudi government. There was a fantastic documentary mm. called Saudi Arabia Uncovered. And it talks about the Saudi regime, how brutal it is, and also its links with terrorism. And yet here we have the British government, European governments, Western governments having very close links with this regime. And instead, everyone's blaming migrants and Muslims. And, and actually, when you see how um, uh, Saudi regime uh, treats its own population, uh, the way they treat children, the way they actually encourage children to, uh, an education system, encourage children to uh, learn to hate everybody else, the hatred of everything decent and human, uh, the way the Saudi regime is actually treating women in, in, in that country. This is exactly what the Islamic State, the Islamic regime of Iran, or the Islamist group in Europe and jihadis, mm -hmm. they want to achieve. So you can't, on the one hand, try to sort of combat this issue um, and then have con continue to um, have a good relation with this state, uh, open up channels of communication and investment and funding of Saudi Arabia into mosques and various networks of uh, student societies, you know, Islamic societies that actually they've created the crea Saudi regime and Islamic regime of government actually created a network of, um, you know, corrupt ne network of Islamists in Europe and uh, everywhere across the world. Um, and that needs to be combated, that needs to be confronted, and there's no way uh, apart from facing this issue and, co you know, to target uh, migrants who are running away from this, that's despicable. And when you point this out to people who um, sometimes unwittingly, sometimes, um, you know, even influenced by the right being sort of uh, uh, policies, suddenly they are amazed that you, you say they're this. They're astonished. And astonished. And I'm not sure why they're astonished, yeah. but you know, I think the point that we're trying to make is that, look, terrorism is something that has become part of our daily lives. It's become, uh, you know, part of the lives of people in Europe. It has been part of the lives of people in the Middle East and North Africa for many decades now. How do we solve this? You know, it's obviously a security issue, but it goes back to, you know, how are we going to stop the Islamist movement? And you stop that movement by cutting up its funding, arresting those who are creating uh, jihad and imposing Sharia law in many places. And also, I think a key important is not to create constituency for these groups. Mm. By, you know, the whole multicultural system, it creates constituency. Don't create environment, you know, that the funding stream needs to be stopped. I mean, that, that's the key issue, uh, you know, and, and you, once you stop that, it's easy for the Islamists to actually be isolated and be defeated. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need to do. Recently, I went to the European Parliament to speak about the issue of secularism and uh, the European Union. There I interviewed the MEP Theresa Barbat about a project she is running promoting secularism, science and rationality. Watch this interview, stay with us. Uh, thank you, um, MEP Theresa Barbat, for having this interview with us. I wanted to ask you about Euro Minds. What is that new project about? Um, we are convinced that the, the, uh, a politician of the 21st century uh, must be informed by science because there are a lot of things that we take in, uh, uh, 
ideological way and you must uh, it is a lot of information and experience uh? we have been a lot of things in the in the 20th 20th century and and, and and then we have a lot of the uh, investigations uh, uh, everything that uh, we can help us to do a more informed uh, informed uh, decisions in the in the political area uh, uh, and I think that it's very important uh, and dialogue w between science and uh, uh, social science uh, uh, because mm, there is a frontier between uh, both and that uh, is, uh, is a lot of uh, information that comes in this frontier for a politician. And I suppose uh, given the fact that we are um, you know, inundated with this religious fundamentalist right-wing movement, reason and science, it just seems so much common sense, doesn't it? Yes, because uh, the only way to, to have a dialogue, a debate, uh, to, to, uh, to achieve an agreement is uh, with the, 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 the things that, that are objective. Because if uh, every, everybody has uh, his uh, private life, his feelings, uh, he believes in, in, in a lot of things, but the only common uh, field is objectivity. Uh, because um, uh, between subjectivities is, is very difficult to, to have a, 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 a result. Uh, it's for us that uh, we think that uh, it's, it's important to separate things. They are an area for political politics and everything that uh, must be in the, in the most part, if possible, be grounded in, in science, in facts, in good theories. And then as it, it, the other is uh, the feelings on the private life of the people. And for this, is uh, we are promoting promoting the, the secular humanism and uh, the, the secular outlook because um, we are uh, we, we, ha we are afraid of the in this moment in Europe the secularism is in danger. How is it in danger? It is in danger because not just of uh, religious fundamentalisms that is uh, perhaps the, the big one uh, problem, uh, but uh, also the the populisms, nationalisms in, in, in regions of, of Europe that uh, politicians manipulate people uh, in, in using uh, lies uh, about the origins, the historical myth and everything that uh, uh, and the finality, the, they want to separate people and manipulate people. Uh, and we have a, a, a very important project that is uh, uh, European and Union, and we have do everything to to save this because it's a guarantee uh, for peace, for progress, for welfare of the people. And secularism, I mean, I think it's something that's important both for Europe but also globally. Why do you think secularism is so key? Um, I think that is possible from uh, the, the uh, from Europe to 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 promote these ideas and discuss with uh, uh, other countries. And for instance, I am um, in the delegation of Maghreb, uh, and my my target is to uh, speak with uh, the, the people of the north of Africa, the, the Maghreb, of my area, my area uh, about uh, free expression and uh, freedom of belief, uh, secularism, uh, education, uh, the, the, the dialogue, intercultural dialogue, but with uh, basic pillars uh, as uh, liber liber uh, freedom of expression, a uh, freedom of conscience, uh, and I think I, I can be I can do a, a, a work a good work uh, with a, 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 a secular outlook uh, that we promote uh, have, uh, as you have seen in in our project Euromine. Thank you very much. Thank you.
We hope you enjoyed the interview with Teresa Barbat. She is a MEP from Spain uh, in the European Parliament. She started a project, EuroMind, in which she's attempting to promote rationalism, science and secularism. And honestly, it is a breath of fresh air to meet uh, parliamentarians, whether it's in the European Parliament or any parliament, that are defending secularism rather than multiculturalism and religion. We are fed up with multiculturalism as a social policy, fed up with religion in our faces day in and day out. We really need people who are going to stand firm defending these sort of universal secular values. And I think that's one thing that's really great about this project. Yes. Um, as you said, this is a, a you know, breath of fresh air. Um, coming from the European Union, because the institutions, um, you know, from the Enlightenment period, from the, you know, after the French Revolution, the whole tradition of having state being be neutral and religion becoming part and parcel of individual sort of conscious and, you know, liberty. Um, but we know that that's not always been the case. Um, it seems that as soon as there is an institution or a government institution, the, the religious institu institution try to take over and influence the, uh, the machinery of the state. And you could see this everywhere, everywhere, and more and more now with the rise of the right-wing religious groups to try to influence and be, become part and parcel of um, the m functioning of the um, state. And this is important to keep that yeah. in mind and always uh, you know, have that as a minimum standard for everybody to respect because it protects everybody, even the religious. Yeah, definitely. And also, you know, when you have parliamentarians addressing social issues, I'm not sure why suddenly religion has become this catch-all uh, thing that's supposed to solve every problem, whether it's homelessness to, you know, um, terrorism to uh, just mention health care. There's always these sort of faith-based initiatives as if they're part of the solution, whereas in fact, really, very often they're part of the problem, keeping it out, keeping it separate, and promoting the sort of rationalism in public policy, social policy, is hugely important. And you notice it more just because it's so lacking in so many of the policy making that we see today. And a, a lot of it is to do with sort of a level of so-called morality in inverted comma that they're trying, okay, this is it, the policy needs to be morality. Actually, it needs to be evidence-based and having a sort of scientific evidence-based that trial of different policies that see, have a look at the results um, and what are the benefits and then come back and revise that and always progress. That needs to be the uh, basis of decision making that sees, you know, to, to, for the society to progress. But on a country, we always see it in education, in um, health, in foreign policy, in any aspect. Dealing with drugs, for example, we, we spoke to in a, in a previous program, you always have this morality, and this, somehow this morality in the inverted comma, which is not really morality, is very much linked to the religious uh, group and religious institution who want to keep their power. The Insane Fatwa of this week is from Sheikh Saleh Al Fawzan. It's the same gentleman that had issued a fatwa against open buffets and all you can eat buffets. Well, this time he has turned his attention on women's voices. He's always actually his attention is <laughs> women's sort of existence, really. And now he said that uh, people can't laugh and, you know, the voice of a woman can't be heard, especially if they're really celebrating. Yeah, he was talking about the uh, ululating, um, the, the zakrata, the ululating of women during a marriage celebration, for example, when they're celebrating. And he basically said that it's evil and if men hear it, it's the source of fitna in society and therefore women should stop evil, 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 basically, and your voice is And this evil. is in, 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 particularly in uh, Arabic-speaking world, uh, this is one of, one of the ways that actually people celebrate and show mm. their joy and, and happiness. But now, no, and, 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 oh, and I, I wonder what happens if you do that. If you ululate at an all-you-can-eat buffet, what happens? Would be double crime. That's just That's really wrong. Bad. And no. you slap your thigh at the that, same time. Yeah, I am. You're going too far here. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. In response, to this our guy, heads are going to explode now. Aren't yes, they? Yeah. yeah. In, in response to this guy, watch this.
This week's slice of life is from Afghanistan and it is uh, about a skateboarding school where 40% of the pupils are girls and it's called Skatistan and it's fantastic because you're talking about a society where for many girls uh, there's this fear of having acid thrown in your face if you go to school uh, by of organized by Islamist groups like the Taliban where you uh, you know um, are dehumanized and criticized and attacked for being female and here you are you've got a school where girls are very much part of learning and skateboarding and this has been going on for a few years and that's the is it still continuing it wasn't just one off um, thing is still continuing and that shows on the after 30 years of brutal sort of islamic um, rule the, the young and the beauty of life uh, springs from everywhere yeah and, and and this this actually is so joyful to see yeah. that even in under the, the, the darkest of the islamist the life exists and it's so beautiful we hope you've enjoyed this week's program and uh, we hope to see you again at the same time, same place next week. Until then, have a lovely week. Goodbye. Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to a year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discussed taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt and that's why the, you need to support us we are and the vo alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa of corruption and immorality so do support us here's a short video from patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week that's nothing support us patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators it's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or web comics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream. And in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.